and welcome to the Cinema ATL Podcast. The Cinema ATL Podcast is a weekly podcast that examines the world of entertainment through the lens of local Atlanta filmmakers. That would be us, your hosts. I'm Michael D. Friedman, and that is... Martin Kelly. And this week we have a special interview with Chris Escobar. The Plaza Theater will be playing host to the Sundance Film Festival this year with screening starting today, January 28th through February 3rd. Martin and I had a chance to chat with Chris the director of the Atlanta Film Society and owner of the Plaza, to discuss Sundance, the Atlanta Film Festival, and running a movie theater during a pandemic. But first, Martin, why don't you tell our listeners how they can help out the podcast? Sure. You can help the podcast by commenting and rating wherever you listen to this podcast. Subscribe there as well. And where can you listen? Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Amazon Podcasts, and more. And we want to hear from you. Uh, you can always tweet us at Cinema ATL or my personal Twitter at Badger33. Or hit me up at, at Marte underscore real one. And if you're attending the Sundance Film Festival, let us know what you're watching. We'd like Definitely. to know. Mm-hmm. And then you can also follow us on Instagram at Cinema ATL Podcast, where we not only talk about the podcast, but we have a lot of other cool features as well. So check that out. Definitely. And also always on the legacy site, CinemaATL.com. All right, that's enough from us. Why don't we get into our conversation with Chris Escobar? So, Chris, welcome to the Cinema ATL podcast. We really appreciate you being here. Um, Why don't you uh, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself before we get started with the interview? Yeah, uh, well, first, thanks for having me on. Um, Mm -hmm. I uh, serve as the executive director of the Atlanta Film Society. This is going on my 10th year. Um, and so we'll, we'll also end up overseeing 10 Atlanta film festivals, which is uh, crazy. Um, uh-huh. and then, uh, as of recently, I, uh, as of, well, it's four years ago now in 2017, I also became the owner of the Plaza theater. Nice. 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 <laughs> so how did you get into this, uh, career that you have You've been going on for 10 years now? Um, what, what did you do at, in, in school and how did you get? into this yeah well i um i studied uh film production at georgia state i did both the undergrad and graduate program there along the way i also worked for several years literally while i was i was getting my undergrad degree worked full-time for a company that uh did a lot of corporate events uh had corporate clients like macy's and uh, six flags and neiman marcus and we would do like fashion shows. We did the lighting of the Macy's tree, the pink pig, and all that kind of stuff. And I ran the video division, which mm. at first was primarily like setting up projectors and screens and running playback, but eventually started to include cameras. And then it got really cool. And we actually started making content for our clients for their events. And that's when it got really fun. And I was, you know, I was a, a third year in my undergraduate program and was getting to run these shoots um that i was like hiring my classmates to be in for me and uh but yeah but i mean i mean really every, i kind of owe all of it to georgia state because georgia state's where i got my training georgia state's where i was able to build my network of colleagues and then georgia state's where i you know met a lot of the professors who really helped mold me not only from a skills and network standpoint but then you know, encouraged, like one of them was the reason why I got involved with the Atlanta Film Society as a member, and that was Jonathan Harris. And then years later, when I was a grad student, um, Dr. K Beck was the one who recommend, you know, who encouraged me to join the board. And then that was really when I got involved was starting on the board of the Film Society um, Mm -hmm. when I was just a a grad student. So, yeah. Nice, nice. So, um, how did like for for those who don't know, you know, we talked about it at the opening. Uh, the Sundance Film Festival has gone to satellite screenings this year, and we kind of just wonder, um, you know, how did they decide on picking the Plaza as one of their screening sites? Uh, well, I mean, they were back in the summer looking at how they were looking ahead to the festival, knowing they were going to have to do something different, and we're basically starting to ask around and sort of kick the tires in several different markets about who would be interested in doing something and how could they work together and to what extent. And, you know, they didn't have it all figured out of what they wanted, except for they wanted to find a way to make 
screenings happen in person in different communities, but work with either film organizations or art house theaters. In our case, it's, it's both. Um, in, in order to, you know, make something for each community that fits that community and enables and empowers those organizations to, to really, you know, serve and make a festival experience that's best fitting for their community. So, that, you know, they weren't, they weren't looking at trying to do a one size fits all or trying to, you know, just show up in town and be like, Hey, we're Sundance, we're calling the shots. And it was actually a really collaborative process. And so we had a lot of meetings, a lot of conversations, a lot of brainstorming, you know, they were asking a lot of questions and listening a lot and throwing ideas out there and seeing what stuck. And so that was true with us. And it was true with um, with certainly other the other partners that are participating in the other cities. I think what helped us kind of be set apart was, A, we were we had the only independent theater in the city, for one. And two, you know, we had actually just had a pretty significant amount of national notoriety uh, over the summer, um, among things, you know, our response to COVID and whatnot, but then mm-hmm. also the launch of these drive-ins. And so the fact that we were right. already, you know, providing these safe options, I mean, really spoke to a lot of concerns they were having. So, um, and, and then, you know, we were, you know, we were able to give some advice to other cities about how to do stuff. And we learned some stuff from other cities and learned some stuff from Sundance. And so, it was really a collaborative process. Nice, nice, great, great. Yeah, I can imagine uh, you're you're pretty busy right now. Uh, you know, the the fest, the Sundance Film Festival kicks off at the Plaza on Thursday, which is today. If uh, if you're listening to the podcast on the day that we're releasing it, um, mm-hmm. have you had a chance to see any of the Sundance films that will be playing at the Plaza? And uh, if you have, have you uh, any favorites? Uh, I, so the short answer is no, I haven't. And see, the thing is, is, uh, you know, this is, this is their programming. So, you know, we were collaborating on what kind of things fit from an interest or a community or kind of a few different ways of kind of going, this stuff makes sense for us. And maybe this stuff, Mm -hmm. not so much, but you know, this is, this is the programming that they're putting their name on. And so, you know, I've, I've had the very lucky privilege of being at Sundance and the vast majority of what I see there is, is pretty incredible. Um, some of yeah. it's, some of it's just not my, you know, not my cup of tea, but, um, mm-hmm. but, uh, but so, you know, we, we knew that they were having a great deal of trust in working with us in terms of execution and in terms of, you know, their, their, to an extent lending us their name. And so we of course can act with us, uh, you know, and a lot of trust with them that these are great films that people are going to enjoy. But yeah, I mean, this is, these, these, how many of these films are finished merely days ago so you know so you know most of them most of them don't even have trailers and most of you know so it's a very different ball game than how we program the atlanta film festival which is out of submissions that come to us primarily and with very few exceptions we 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 tend to get a few titles a couple handfuls of titles from sundance and with rare exception a few other festivals so you know um, so it's a very different experience in putting it together, but it's not like we were starting from scratch. You know, they, they've already been doing the work since, you know, last April on, on going through submissions and, you know, and then narrowing down the programming choice. Right. And, and I know, uh, you know, uh, I, I know that there's a uh, sort of co-partners, uh, not just, uh, the Atlanta film society, uh, and the plaza, but there's also other community partners and did that have something to do with the kind of programming choices that they made for Atlanta? So the other, so we're the only city doing it like this. So we put, okay. we put together, we're, we're like, Hey, this is the city that did the Olympics probably better than anybody. And, <laughs> and we also, you know, particularly when it comes to the beyond film conversations, you know, the way we saw it is like, look, it's not just the people coming to the screenings. There's a real, you know, worldwide platform here because these are these are free and available to the public to all of the Sundance audience. And so, you know, like uh, like Outcast says, the South the South has something to say. You know, um, <laughs> and we didn't want to hog that conversation. And so we thought, well, if we're going to have an opportunity where we have the Sundance microphone, we're going to share it and make sure it's with the whole community. And uh, and so we turned to a lot of our 
sort of counterparts in in storytelling, not even organizations strictly in film, but in storytelling. And we were like, look, we don't even really know what we're playing yet, but we'd love to do something with you. And we know it's during COVID and we, you know, you guys are probably all still trying to survive all this, but like, there's a way you can join us. We'd love to do that. And so um, we probably were talking to, you know, I don't know, 12 or 13 different organizations. And then based on the film programming we had, some of that made a lot more sense than others. And and so, we, you know, it ended up kind of whittling down, you know, and they were like, oh, well, you know, it's it, it kind of, it's, it's pull, so, you know, some of them were like, eh, it pulls a little steam out. Some of it's a bandwidth thing. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why there aren't other organizations, but it wasn't, it's certainly not because we didn't want other organizations or other organizations didn't want to be a part of it. It's just kind of a, you know, how it sort of all, you know, how all the dust settled, so to speak, or all the chips fell. Um, but yeah, we, so we have this host committee uh, and we're the only ones doing a host committee. And the idea is that these host committees are, are paired to a film. Uh, this host committee organizations are paired to a film and then also leading a beyond film conversation that might be tied to that same film. It might just be, you know, about, you know, the kind of work that they do and what their mission's about year round uh, as it relates to film and television. So like uh, most of them are film and TV organizations. Um, but even for instance, the AIDS healthcare foundations is a, is a host committee right. member and, and they're having, um, you know, they're, they're partnered on the film passing, which is about, uh, like Tessa Thompson's, uh, character is, is someone who is African American who passes for white. Uh, and so, you know, she and her, and her friend are kind of living on two different sides of the, the African American experience. And so, um, you know, it, it explores those racial issues. And so they're leading a conversation um, that while it's not, you know, necessarily tied to the film, the, you know, it is sort of inspired by the film. And it's about, you know, moving from racism to racial healing and inclusion, you know, so it's like, and as that relates to film and television and, and, um, and, you know, got some fantastic people. And we have a number of other panels that are not actually tied to films, some of which are by host committee members, and some are just people in Atlanta who are doing awesome things and want to um, have a conversation around what we call our Atlanta themes that we came up with, which are innovation and inclusion. And so we've got folks who are doing great work um, or, or, or are pulling some great thought leadership around that work of either, in some cases, both of those, right. of those topics. So. No, and I thought they were interesting. Like I, I heard your, um, I was on the uh, the announcement call the other day, and I thought some of those partnership uh, matchings were right on, you know, right on. Like you know, Video Drone mm-hmm. doing a, a midnight screening and, and things yeah. of that nature. So I think that those were really cool. So uh, kudos to that kind of concept. I thought that that's really thinking uh, outside the box. Well, I appreciate that, and and really, the, you know we kind of had a sense of what films might work for certain partners or others, but we were really like, which film do you want to do? And so they were also opting. So there's, you know, there's, there's the collaboration between us and Sundance and then there's with us and our host committee members and, you know, really trying to make something where where no one's kind of force feeding anything to anyone. And, you know, similarly, and this is, this is actually really important, um, you know, with as challenged right now as, as cinemas are among other businesses, obviously, but, for some reason, especially cinemas, there's this weird like, oh yeah, I'll go to a restaurant or I'll go to a bar, or ride an airplane, but I'm not going to a movie theater. Like it's just weird. <laughs> like what? Is, how is that? Well, I don't know. Um, and um, and so you know, there's been different efforts here and there for support or relief, and you know, from either little grants or um, or even certain studios that are you know saying, hey, we're gonna you know give these films available to you at a cheaper rate or whatever. But right. no one has put a program that is has the potential to benefit and support uh, theaters and film organizations like Sundance did. Because this is uh, tiered a few different ways, but one of the most significant things is we keep all the ticket sales. Nice. All the ticket sales, all the money that gets spent on, on watching movies here in Atlanta stays here in Atlanta. And the only thing they asked for was that they might get up to 25% of the capacity should they have badge holders and VIP guests and whatever in our market? Um, you know, that ended up not being the case. So we, they ended up letting us keep hundred percent of our 
capacity. And so what we did with these host committee members is we said, look, we don't want to just talk the talk. We want to walk the walk. And so we're including these other organizations and, and they have a certain role and a certain amount of authorship and a certain amount of, you know, um, leeway and autonomy here. Um, we want them to also share in the success. So, so we're giving them a quarter of the capacity and they can either choose, like, I want 25% of the capacity to give to my members and give to my donors and give to my staff and board or whatever, or they, they can choose. I just want 25% of the ticket sales for that screening and they get that. Right. So uh, that's, great. that's yeah. a, that is a, that is a sort of share the love and share the success model that we normally couldn't do say with the Atlanta film festival, which is kind of like takes, you know, scraping together every dollar we can to make it happen because there's a whole bunch of production, a whole bunch of, I mean, it's a year's worth of work and planning. This, because this kind of has a running start in programming, in marketing, in graphic design, there's a lot of things that are kind of, you know, like I said, I have a, have a running start for us. You know, we don't have the same expenses involved. And so we can share in the success. And I, you know, I really felt like the right thing to do. And it's kind of a continuation of this whole spirit of the whole thing anyway. So, um, so we're really excited to be able to do that. That's not something we're normally in a position to be able to do. Yeah, I think I mean I, I agree that it's it's it was really exciting to hear the you know the the things that are going on with that and um yeah I kinda uh even like how forward thinking Sundance has been, I thought that was really great. And I wondered if this satellite program is something that, that they might consider to continue even after this year's festivals, like some it's in some limited capacity because it seems like this is a great opportunity for their brand to spread that Sundance mm-hmm. Film Festival. Uh, brand around the country in a way that they hadn't previously thought about doing, yeah. but but could you know enhance the engagement for them. Yeah, I think you know I, I I'll go say you know that that kind of gets tossed around a little bit by you know hey are we thinking this is gonna and and they're not saying either way right now. I I don't think they want to rule it out. I don't I don't think they want to jump the gun either. Um, I I will say you know there have been some Sundance offshoots like Sundance in London sure. and some of those stuff, mm-hmm. but I, I will say that you know for them the real priority is the convergence and like they they are really bending over backwards especially when it comes to the the new frontier and the and the like VR stuff I mean the kind of stuff they're doing to just try and emulate some version of the experience of all these people coming together for all kinds of different things and um is is really important to them and and so i i you know i'm 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 not going to try and speak for them but i'd be willing to bet that if they have the bandwidth capacity and you know resources to be able to you know put back on a sundance like they used to and there be and then some that right. uh that maybe they explore both but i'd be willing to bet that if it felt like one was going to compromise the other they're going to prioritize getting back to original you know but i mean i'm, I'm also I'm, it, that's really just my guess i mean so i i think even anyone within sundance would say we really just got to see how this all works out and sure. see if you know it it, it, it has the intent we ha- we intended if it plays out like we had hoped and if it seems sustainable and doable or if this is just you know one of those kind of crazy things we do be able to be able to kind of get through this crazy time and it has its time and place and then and that's it. I'd be willing to bet it's not going to be all or nothing, though. Honestly, I'd be willing yeah. to bet that there's probably a third solution that is maybe it's not simultaneous, or maybe it's just online, or maybe who knows. Right. Um, no, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I agree that that it's it's probably something they're certainly seriously contemplating, but uh, but but it's still a wait and see for sure. Right. Right. So I, I think we'll see. But, I, you know, I, I, I will say I can't well, who I can speak for is us, which is, you know, this has there's a lot of ways this could have been this could have gone badly uh, in terms of like, like I said, they could have been like, hey, we're Sundance and we're showing up and we're calling the <laughs> shots. And, you know, you're, right. you're lucky to just be attached to like it that literally has not been the case at all. I mean, I, I can't I can't overstate how surprised and relieved and thankful I am with how open and collaborative and understanding and flexible and you know and they're still being true to who they are and they're not they're not sacrificing you know the quality of the experience and the, i mean this is the biggest name brand in independent film this is a 40 plus million dollar organization you know it's a big deal um and um 
and and that you know and so the fact that they're being as collaborative and as trusting and as uh you know open and willing to try things as they are is very rare um so um especially with something as as you know precious as this you know it's like you couldn't imagine like the super bowl being like all right who wants to help us throw the super bowl around the country like, <laughs> this wouldn't happen you know what i mean like right uh, right and so and uh and so yeah i mean so I, i'd be open to it because they've, it's been pretty awesome and, it, and it's and it's not it's not to say that it's everything's been been easy in a cakewalk and as as expected but i think it's you know we're we're dealing with a, a whole new world in a in a, with a whole new kind of event and a whole you know so i think so there a lot of this is just exploring and figuring it out and you know whatever um but I, I i think everyone really feels like we've been along for the ride with them and um and it's not like just they are driving and and there's a lot of levels of us opting in and you know and 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 so um it's been it's been really awesome cool cool well speaking of uh you know uh, continuing to take risks and things like that. Uh, you, you did mention, you know, one of the things that attracted Sundance to you was particularly the the Plaza Theater and how you've managed to operate during COVID times. And, uh, you know, many other theaters have had to close, but you found ways to continue to operate. Um, can you kind of expound on like some of the difficulties that you might have had when you were trying to reopen? And um, also, you know, have you discovered any new things that maybe you know, even though COVID has struck us hard, maybe you've learned some stuff that you might incorporate going on in the future mm-hmm. once the pandemic is over. Yeah, well, I, I'll start with that one and then we can work backwards. Um, you know, I think the one thing that this has really opened my eyes to, and I and I think maybe this will resonate with everybody, is aside from COVID, you know, what's, what's happening in terms of social justice and what there's so many things that I think people over the last 10 months are realizing maybe on a scale or a level that you had not really quite stopped to think about as much. Mm-hmm. And, and one of them for me has been, man, like we're stuck at home right now, but we know that eventually we're going to get back to life and whatever. There's so many people who have, who have been stuck at home for years for any number of health reasons or you right. know mental health reasons or otherwise that have just been excluded from the world. And, and so we, you know, we've, everybody's done all this work to, you know, be able to have zoom meetings and be able to do stuff virtually and, and, and be able to stay connected as we're all sort of stranded or whatever at home. And, but we've never been, we've never been aware enough or cared enough or motivated enough or any number of the things to do that when people, there's so many people have been homebound for, I mean, forever. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think yeah. I think that component of it is like man, now we all have a firsthand experience of what those folks have been going through, and and that like yeah even if it, everything can't be ex- you know even if being together and in person is is better, does that mean you should say well then it's it's that or nothing you know like no I think you know I think it really does I used to only think about it from a matter of convenience of like, Oh, I couldn't make it. Can I watch it online? And I used to think like, you know, having that option gives people kind of a, gives people like a a reason to sort of opt out and be like, ah, you know, whatever. Like, um, Mm -hmm. but you can't, you you can't think about it like that. You got to think about the people who have to do not have the option of being there and, and, and want to be a part of it and connected to it any way they can, even if it's not as ideal as being there in person like that, like that clicked for me over these last several months. Um, and, and that, that made me see all this in a whole new way. And, and so, you know, going forward, I, I see that for Plaza and the film society, we're always going to have virtual to some, you know, some component to some extent, right. and it's not going to be necessarily possible for everything, but we're, we're not, it's not going to be an afterthought. It's going to be, okay, so we're going to do this thing. How can we also create a means so people can tap in virtually? Um, that's always going to be a, a top line um, uh, thing, and so um, so that's one of the things that I think I just for me I discovered along the way, uh, and that I think will stick around forever. Um, the other thing is, how many freaking people have never been to a drive-in, and that, that's a tragedy. <laughs> right. I mean, right. I I I will say I don't go to the Starlight Drive-in as often as I'd like. 
But over the last, especially like when I had kids, when I had kids, then I made sure we would go at least twice a year. Um, right. And I got to tell you, it's a pretty awesome way to watch a movie when you got kids because you don't know at what point they're just like have had enough, you know? <laughs> and, and then guess what? Yeah. E- everyone has to leave the movie theater. Right, um, right. I've been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's like, you know what? If they've had enough, they can hang out in the front seat. They can pass out. They can whatever. And you can at least continue having your evening. Yeah. Uh, there, It is kind of awesome um because it, it it gets you out of the house you're doing something different especially if you do it right and you got a you know if you got a car that you can put the seats down in the back and you know kind of set up and um you know bring your own food if you want or right. whatever you know like it's an occasion but it's right. kind of an easy occasion it's a comfortable occasion it's kind of a blend of, of 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 the comfort of staying at home without the monotony of staying at home and um and so you know but it's insane i mean I'd be willing to bet that ninety percent of the people who have come to our drive-ins and, and certainly during the film had never been to a drive-in, uh, and so that's it's kind of exciting because you know that's part of what the plaza is about is you know helping people rediscover experiences and ways of watching movies that have been that have been gone you know and 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 right. and, and, and you know having sort of a selective memory of of kind of good parts of history you know good parts of of culture that is that is all but gone you know obviously some things are better left in the past but um <laughs> but uh but but it's not to say all of it so um right, right. and so um and so that's been kind of cool you know and, and in some ways it is sort of a simpler way of watching movies and 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 it's like and the sense of relief that especially in those first few months where people were just like i mean we could have been pl- playing videos of paint drying people would have been happy to get out of the house and so the fact that they're playing fun movies and good movies and and like and and they were you know their friends were also coming and they'd park next to each other and they're keeping their distance but still having some so like that's what all this underlined is this it's more than a big screen and, and good sound you know it's the ability to get together and share an experience with people you know and people you don't know frankly right and then and then the other element of it too is undivided attention Mm -hmm. and 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 that i'm here to do this thing that i'm i mean i i i I watch movies at home just as much as the next guy but i also have laundry to do and i also have kids (laughs) and like right there's not this like there's not this no this is what we're doing and nothing else at home you just can't have those boundaries exactly and so right. and so when you're if you're in a theater or at a drive-in there is that level of we're here for this purpose and and that is that is more important than i think we've ever <laughs> given credit to with as right. distracted as we are these days so i think you're right about that it's one of the biggest things that you know i certainly miss is uh the you know, going to the theater as often as I used to. I mean, I, I was I was certainly a uh, go to the theater every week person. So it's uh, certainly not that anymore. <laughs> right. And, and I mean, even to a certain, like if you're in a movie theater and you're the only person, you might you might take out your phone if you need to check something or whatever, you know, because you know you're not bothering anybody. But as soon as you just got a couple other people in the theater, all of a sudden you're like, you're disciplined. You're not going to take that phone out. You're not going to be distracted and you're in the moment, you know? Yeah, um, definitely. And there's something about that, like peer pressure, so to speak, of, yeah, of right. respecting, of respecting the occasion of respecting the experience of other people. Well, that, it's also that makes yours better. Yeah. It's also just the communal experience of seeing something and, and, and getting the reactions of people, even if, like you said, if they're not people that you don't even know, but just that can really influence, you know, how a movie is to you. Because oh, absolutely. Because other people are enjoying it, you're going to enjoy it a little bit more too. Absolutely. But you're not going to have that communal experience if you're not fully vested, you know, if you're, right. not, right. you're not fully present. And so that's part of why that's the case, right? That's why the movies are funnier and scarier and more emotional is because you are – in the moment and present and you're not focused or even thinking about anything else that isn't that movie. And that's, right. I mean, and, and that's like, that's sort of, it's not just other hearing other people laughing. Although, although especially for comedy, like there are these things that, you know, it sort of it reinforces the permission and, you know, there are certain mm-hmm. emotions that are enhanced for that reason. But, but I, I think it's the communal experience 
it's circular. It, it drives then the un, undivided attention and the undivided attention then makes the communal experience and vice, you know, so. Definitely, definitely. No, no, that's all, that's all true. So uh, we've been talking about Sundance a lot, but let's talk a little bit about how planning is going for the 2021 Atlanta Film Festival. Can you kind of give us a sneak preview? I can. Uh, we are going to announce our first three selections uh, during Sundance. Nice. Um, I will go ahead and sh- since this isn't airing until Thursday, I'll go ahead and share with you all one of them, which is Ooh. a feature. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an exclusive right here, guys. <laughs> um, so it's a documentary feature film about President Jimmy Carter called Carterland. Cool. Uh, awesome. That okay. is Very that cool. is phenomenal. Um, and so we're super excited about that. Um, and. Um, uh, and then there's a couple other ones that that are that are really exciting and great. And we're each time we do a first wave, you know, we, we've taken different approaches to it. Of like, let's have one of a little bit of everything, and let's have, you know, the idea is let's have some films that that speak in different ways to some of what the rest of the festival will be. Um, and uh, but but this week, I think they're going to be moving then then making the next round of invites. Um, and so, yeah, we're, so we're going to be making these announcements during Sundance and then, and then also making progress. Here's, here's the, the big thing with the 2021 Atlanta Film Festival. We were expecting to have a drop in submissions, um, for the 2020 festival, we had 8,600 submissions between films and screenplays. It's a lot. Wow. It's one of the, that already made us one of the 10 most competitive in the world, right? of 4,000 film festivals worldwide. Right, right. Um, instead of a drop, we went up to nine, over 9,400 submissions. Wow. Which is wow. mind boggling, especially Definitely. when you consider that back in 2011, um, it was like 1,500 submissions. Right, no, no, definitely. That's a huge <laughs> increase over the over that period, yeah. for sure. And, for sure. Um, so, uh, so we are just, that is that is a feeling that both makes you feel good and also, uh, I it's, it's like it's like cue the Joe Biden meme of like don't fuck this up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like the sense of responsibility that that over ninety four hundred, not just artists but teams of artists, right, right, have have entrusted us and given us the opportunity to consider this piece of art that they have you know poured blood sweat and tears over in some cases years right um all for the chance of being able to show it and share it here with our community i mean that is that is humbling is exciting it's encouraging it's uh but it's definitely it has weight to it for sure no i i was gonna say i bet it's really nerve-wracking i've been part of the selection process over, over the years uh, at certain times and i bet the the fact that there's so many submissions puts that extra sort of weight on everyone to you know and pressure because there's going to be a lot of worthy films that don't get discussed. Exactly. which is always heartbreaking that's the th- i mean once upon a time i won't lie once and before my time it was just like hey we're just going to play the the, the best ones right and, <laughs> and you just <laughs> narrow it down to the best ones and, and that's enough right right but right. like at a certain i mean we play 150 films usually each year right Mm-hmm. And until we we start to have the capacity and the bandwidth and the and the audience and stuff like that to start doing like what Toronto does and play like four hundred films, a massive freaking crazy number, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? And I'm not, and, and I think over time we will start to play more films, but we, we're we're trying to balance it, um, and and it, and that's certainly tricky, but. Um, you know, it's not a. You know, I, a lot of people think that our programmers have the best job because they literally get paid to watch movies. But yeah, no. but also imagine imagine what your inbox looks like if <laughs> if at least once a year you are making a hundred and fifty people. You're making the day for a hundred and fifty people, and you're now the, your favorite email that they've gotten, and then eight thousand people, nine thousand yes. people hate your guts. Exactly. <laughs> Not, no, not, no, not, not the easiest job. No, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> not the best way to keep friends, I can say. You know, it's, and that's the thing is like, if people like, look, we have certain, we're, we're not a niche festival, right? We, meaning like we don't just focus on a genre or a certain community, 
but we right. do prioritize certain like like if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're a filmmaker from the south, if you're LG, uh, LGBTQ, um, and especially if you're from Atlanta or from Georgia, like we especially want those films, right? right. Um, it's not to say if you're not one of those, you're not getting in. It's not to say if you are one of those, you are getting in. But like that, those are those are sort of our 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 like our pillars, right? If we have specialties, mm-hmm. we don't have a single specialty, but we have things that are are very true to us. If we were these are our Olympic rings, so to speak, right? Right. Um, and so, uh, but you know, even in Atlanta, the number of submissions we get from Atlanta, forget the rest of Georgia, just Atlanta, keeps right. growing. We could do a whole film festival with only films from Atlanta. And so the whole our the whole reason our organization was created five decades ago was to do two things. To uh to bring uh to create an opportunity for local independent filmmakers to have their work showcased alongside some of the best works from around the world, and then and then give that service to the people the the audience and the community in Atlanta of of showing them some great works of independent film. And so the better the other stuff is, the more it means as a local filmmaker to be in this festival, right? Yeah. And yeah, so definitely. and so there's also a balancing act there. And, and so we've usually stayed around 20 25% or so of the films we have uh have been from Atlanta. It's not to say that like if we got 25% no matter, you know, no matter how awesome other films are, they're not getting it. No, that's not really true. It's just sort of, it's sort of the ratio it really works out to be more or less. Um, sure. It does mean that if, uh, and, and, and so for us, it's not about the programming and result. We are, we tend to look at it in the submissions pool because if you have, if you have diversity and range in and inclusion in the submissions pool, it's the same thing with job applicants, frankly, uh, then you don't have to, um, you know, bend your standards because you got you've got the range you need in the pool you're picking from in the first place, and we're right. very lucky to, that we do. And so, if if for instance we see that we have an abnormal number of local films submitting than we're used to seeing, that uh, then we are going to maybe shake the trees a little bit more and be like, hey, what do you got? What do you got? What do you got? Um, but but it is end up being difficult because we serve the you know local filmmaking community. Most of the people on staff have friends that are filmmakers. And inevitably, more of them get turned down than get accepted, and it's it's mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to keep friends. <laughs> like it's, yeah. No, no, like, no. You know, I, and, yeah. I, and I've been rejected twice by this organization, so I know how it feels yeah. firsthand. <laughs> so, yeah, I think Martin and I have both yeah. been rejected too, but it's cool. Yeah. We, yeah. we well, no, yeah. <laughs> we've, been on, we've been on both sides of that fence, you know, yeah. before. So you know, we yeah. we understand it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to bring up you, you brought the, the 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 Biden meme. I'm going to bring up another meme. Uh, no pressure, but we're going to be the the Bernie meme. We're going to be sitting there in our chair with our men <laughs> <just> silently <laughs> judging you. you know? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love how um, how how much fun he's having and he's using that to raise uh, yeah, some money. And it's kind of cool. I think you know, he embraced it. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, so yeah, I think we've pretty much run out of time. Uh, but I did want to do a, a quick lightning round before sure. we let you go. Um, we're just going to give you some really quick questions and uh, try to answer them as you know, succinctly as possible, I guess. Uh, favorite film? Mm, Pan's Labyrinth. Ooh. Nice. Favorite director? Christopher Nolan. Interesting. Uh, popcorn or candy? Depends on who makes it. Uh, <laughs> if it's the Plaza popcorn, then that's the best popcorn in the whole city of Atlanta. If not, I would, I would agree if that. not, then I'm going to play it safe and go for a Snickers. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. Uh, front of the theater or the back of the theater? The middle. Right. The middle is the best. If I but if I had to pick between one of the two, it also kind of depends on the distances. Like uh, the front row at the plaza is amazing because there's like a stage. The front row is further right. away from yeah, the screen. Yeah. But but if but if I'm talking about most theaters, then I'd probably take the back over the front row. Okay. And then finally, uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Sorry, I, I, I feel like no, I'm that's not, a good answer. No, that's not, a good answer. I'm not smart. I feel like I'm not smart enough to appreciate Star Trek for as much as the people who love it so much appreciate it. Like <laughs> Star Wars is just more emotional and is uh, and is more ro- uh, kind of romantic and more fantastical, whereas Star mm-hmm. Trek is, you know, is is actual sci-fi. You know, so I feel like they're unfairly compared, but. 
I you know I try and I respect for the Star Trek, but yeah, I'll Star Wars all day. Ah, cool. Great, great, cool, excellent. Well, we totally appreciate you coming on to the podcast, and we're really excited about the Sundance Film Festival coming to the Plaza Theater. And uh, before we wrap up, uh, why don't you share with us some just some details about the Atlanta Film Festival and, and like what when the when the dates are coming up? Yeah. And, and, things like that you bet well and, and first thank y'all for having me on uh, you guys always do a bunch of great work so i appreciate being a part of it um and uh yeah, sundance is going on right now and then not too far out is the atlanta film festival april 22nd to may 2nd already going to be making announcements on the film programming and conference programming and folks who buy their badges now um get a much better deal and get it for a lot cheaper so don't wait Cool. And that's Atlanta, Atlanta film society.org. Atlanta film society.org is everything we do. Atlanta film festival.com is just about the festival. Gotcha. So that's, that's a great place for, you know, for people to go uh, for the information about the Sundance and as well as uh, upcoming information about the Atlanta film festival. Absolutely. Thanks for that plug. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Martin, do you have anything you wanted to add before we, Say goodbye. Uh, no, just thanks for coming on, Christopher. Appreciate it. Appreciate y'all. Thanks. Well, thanks again for listening to the Cinema ATL podcast. We really want to thank Christopher Escobar for joining us for a very interesting interview. I really enjoyed it. Martin, what did you think? No, definitely, definitely liked uh, the interview for sure and appreciate everything Christopher's doing. Uh, and, of course, what Sundance and Atlanta Film Festival are doing. Yeah, it's really exciting times. Um, but yeah, before we leave, uh, please remember to share the podcast. You can uh, always tweet us, Instagram, follow us there, all those cool things and share it. Uh, we'd also like to thank Eureka Failure for providing the music as they do each and every week. Check them out at eurekafailure.bandcamp.com. And Martin, any final words of wisdom for our listeners today? Well, I think uh, Christopher touched upon it. I just think uh, I say this, a variation of this every week. Let's all be good to each other. Let's check in on each other. And let's, uh, you know, be nicer to each other if we can. Sounds good to me. Uh, join us next time on the Cinema Tale podcast. And we'll see you then. Yeah.